And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Joanne Helfrick, author, channeler, and guide, whose recent book is titled Afterlives, First-Hand Accounts of 20 Notable People, which we're going to discuss today and more. Joanne, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. I'm happy to be here. So Joanne, how did you become a channeler in the first place? Well, uh, I guess that goes back to around um, 1985 when I discovered the Seth material written by Jane Roberts. Uh, She channeled the non-physical personality Seth from 1964 until, uh, I'm sorry, 1963 until her death in 1984. Together, Seth and Jane wrote over 40 books about the nature of reality because Seth being non-physical has has or had, still has, he is still around, I think, uh, this very wide perspective of the nature of reality. And so it was sort of quite accidental how he came through and the material's fantastic. It's the gold standard of channeling in many people's opinion, including mine. And uh, and she was assisted by her husband, Rob Butts, who transcribed everything. So I discovered that information in 85, and I met a man who would become my husband who was really into the information. And so we didn't have children. We don't have children. And so we spent a lot of our time and energy um, doing conferences, building community in the Seth Reader community, and also promoting other channelers and that we discovered sort of along the way who had information consistent with Seth's. So um, we moved from Philly to Castaic to discover this stuff, um, to, to develop our interest more deeply. And I became interested in certain aspects of material that we found were consistent between Seth and other channelers. And it was called, it's called the intent information. And it's a typology to help people discover sort of why they're born and what they might want to express. So I got a Ouija board and I um, amended it with colored dots representing the nine families of consciousness, as the information is called. And I just wanted to, to do little readings for people. I saw a lot of people studying really deep information. But a lot of them needed guidance in their lives. They didn't know how to apply it. So I sat with a Ouija board that was basically dead because I forgot to mention I I was always terrible at using the Ouija board. But one thing led to another and I got that thing to move and I started getting letters and, and paragraphs and then Rose encouraged me to, uh, and then a, a new a, a new energy came through named Rose who um, is another very wide energy who described herself similarly uh, as Seth did. And it became whole transcripts uh, because she taught me how to autotype. She encouraged me to move from the Ouija board uh, to the keyboard. And Rose moved my fingers across that QWERTY keyboard in order as if to say, this is how you type. So I have some kind of a a kinetic ability to channel through my fingers, through my hands. And that went on and on and on. Rose dictated uh, two books and we have a wealth of information on our website, um, thewayofspirit.com. And that's how it all started. And it moved eventually into my interest in um, channeling specific people. So Rose is very wide, but I was always interested too in seeing if I could talk to individuals who had passed. And because Rose and I did uh, private sessions for people, sometimes our clients would ask to speak to someone who had passed. And I didn't know if I would be able to do that. And then because this greater energy was coming through, I learned that we could. (laughs) 
And but I was never confident about my abilities. But then um, eventually, I I became more and more confident in my ability to not only channel Rose, this very wide energy, but uh, particular people, including J.D. Salinger, the American writer, uh, with whom I wrote a small book with um, uh, about his afterlife. It's called The Afterlife of J.D. Salinger. So it happened very quickly. My abilities sort of, I sort of stumbled upon all these abilities in a way, uh, just by trying things. Until finally, I I, um, I completed the book Afterlives uh, uh, in 2020. I want to go back to something. You mentioned mm-hmm. that on the Ouija board, you put down nine families of consciousness. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? The idea is that intent is a sort of design element for our physical reality. And these intents... Uh, move through us as a way to explore our reality and gain fulfillment. And there are nine of them that were provided by Seth and 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 in in one of his books, not a whole lot of people uh, read that part because it was a it was found in a sort of unique book along the way. But then two other uh, channelers also, you know, talked about the same ones. And what's fascinating is that when the two additional channelers channeled the intent information, they were there were nine just like Seth's, and they all had the unique, the same unique names, all spelled similarly. Sumari, they are the uh, artists who work for social change. Uh, they are the Sumafi, who are the people who are most interested in the least distortion. So you might find uh, librarians, archivists to be of Sumafi intent. And so, and when one Zuli, who are the ones who are interested in human form and are the sportsmen and the ballerinas and the models and so on. And it's not a way to put people into boxes. It's a way to help them sort of orient themselves in the world in ways in which we can say, Oh, yeah, that's why when I was a kid, I liked doing this. You know, I liked dancing. I liked doing gymnastics and those kinds of things. And so they help us sort of connect with what we love the most and what we desire the most. And everyone, it's not a it's not a way to put people into boxes. It's a way to say, look, at everyone is all of them. It's just that we have them in different degrees and each person is unique. And there are many, many ways to express this intent in our lives in satisfying ways. A lot of times when we're reading the lines on the page, we're actually kind of reading and we hear it in our own voice. Yeah. And I think that's because the part of the brain that controls the eyes kind of overlaps the other part of the, the brain of hearing. And I believe that when we're writing, we probably kind of, in our own voice, are, are hearing it as we write. So when you're doing this automatic writing, or I probably even call it automatic typing, are you hearing anything when you're typing? I call it autotyping. And I'm not the only one who does it. Um, I don't hear so much. Sometimes sometimes I'll get a word or two, but it all comes through my fingers. And I find that, or most of it comes through my fingers. I find that helpful because if I can focus on just my fingers, then I don't have to allow my thoughts to overlap with what I might be hearing so much. But yes, I do get certain words as I go. It's almost like your fingers are on autopilot. Yeah, my whole body is sort of on autopilot and my fingers are in charge. Would you say that you're not really even paying attention to what you're writing and then you have to kind of go back and read it and then say, wow, I can't believe I wrote this. Yes, that's exactly what happens. I really have to keep my ego self out of the way so that I'm focused on just the letters and the words and not finishing sentences. 
And I found, uh, I've heard of writers, in fact, Richard Bach, who wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull, um, actually found Jane and Rob and wanted to talk to them because he found, he said that uh, he didn't feel like he was the author of these books necessarily, or or the only author, because he would look back on what he had written and 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 said, well, I didn't write this. I don't remember writing this. And I think that's very true for someone who's writing. I've I've heard people say people that I know who don't consider themselves channelers, but something else, some greater self, let's say, kind of takes over, and you go into a sort of trance state, perhaps light trance state, which is I'm in when I'm, which is what I'm in when I'm channeling. And so I think it's it's sort of t- channeling is more typical, and that's one of the messages I try to tell people because it could be anything you know that we do can be informed by our greater selves or God or divine sense or whatever you want to call it. I just happen to do this this way, and it's not it's special in its own way. But it's also not special when you think of all the marvelous things that people do every day uh, in, in, in expressing their, their, great, their greatness in, in some ways, their godness, their sense of the divine, I think. Do you think prior to reading these books, you had some sort of spiritually transformative experience that kind of thinned the veil for you? Or do you think it was just the action of reading these books that changed you energetically? It's funny. It's, it's a great question. I don't think the books, the books were more of an experience of seeing my thoughts put into words, seeing how I intuited, how I had intuited reality put into words that made me say, oh yeah, I kind of, I kind of thought this all along, you know, now flashback to when I was five years old, I, one of my first experiences was standing in the kitchen of the house I grew up in actually, well, I didn't grow up there. We moved before I turned six. It was in upstate New York. And so I know I was only five years old or less. And I was standing there in the kitchen and just going about my business. And all of a sudden I had this thought, why is all this here? (laughs) You know, who am I? How do I know that anyone else exists? And so it was a real existential experience for a five-year-old, but I remember it very, very clearly. And so I think I've always been this way, right? I've always questioned these kinds of things and have had a very philosophical kind of view of things that I really didn't know what to do with. You know, I didn't know how to make that real until I found the Seth material and maybe something clicked in my head that said, oh, well, this something definitely said, well, this is possible. But I didn't really think of it as something that I could do, not until many years later. Um, in my experiences, and it was 2007 when I first started experimenting with the Ouija board. So I think I'd always had this deep intent, let's say, of exploring this kind of information and doing this kind of thing uh, that I didn't really, um, I didn't really find until I was, you know, in my late 40s. In your book, Afterlives, you talk to a lot of famous um, and or notable people like Anthony Bourdain and Robin Williams. Mm-hmm. How did you choose these people? Oh, that's that's another great question. Um, it started out just with my experimenting from time to time with talking to people who had passed. And that's what happened when I first reached out to Anthony Bourdain right after his death in 2018. He committed suicide. And I was one of his fans who was just left bereft because it was just so shocking that this 
beautiful man who had so much going for him would do that. And so I reached out to him. And again, I wasn't confident with my abilities. So I posted what came through on my blog and people looked at it and said, hey, you know, this this looks really good. And so I was encouraged by that. <clears throat> it wasn't until uh, almost two years later, around 4 a.m., that suddenly I had the random thought that I wanted to speak to uh, the American journalist and author Hunter S. Thompson. And I tried to trace my thoughts about where that came from, you know, because it was so random. And I thought, okay, well, I'll try to talk to him. I'd always liked him, you know, and um, and I did. And another great uh, transcript came through. And so I was I was very encouraged. And um, and it was just something fun that we did. It was COVID lockdown. Our nephew came over with his dog on weekends. And I would read, you know, these things aloud, just having fun. And the next person that came through was Ayn Rand, the Russian American author. And she 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 didn't want to stop. That's very her. You know, she wrote these 800 page tomes, right? And she also said, there are other people here who would like to speak with you, but they want to be asked first. And that just blew my mind because all the while I've been thinking, well, I don't want to take up their time. They must have something better to do. You know, those kinds of things. I was shy, you know, and, and so, uh, excuse me, I, so I did, I, I kept going, but I now had the added responsibility of saying, well, who will I ask if all of a sudden I could, it seemed that I could speak to anyone that I wanted to, who would it be? Because every time I tried and throughout the book, I would ask people to come through and they did that. So my, my hunch was right. Now, how I decided was um, was that I knew in the beginning that I needed to set an intent for the book. By now, I had realized, like around, around the time Ayn came through, I knew that this had to be a book. And so I set the intention for this book to be as helpful to people as possible. It wasn't to make a lot of money. It was it was there to help people, and it was there to um, for the authors to come through so that they would have a consistent experience, that they would provide information about their lives, their afterlives, and give any wisdom that they wanted to to the reader. And I also asked for a committee to be formed of all of them to ensure a valuable reading experience for the reader so that it was fluid. I didn't want to have to edit things. So the book itself is as they came through. Mm -hmm. And somehow I was able, whether I was asking them or they were telling me, and I'm picking up intuitively who would come through, I still don't know. Uh, but but they how they came through in the book is how they came through in the writing of the book. You are concerned, you know, if they're busy on the other side. Yeah. What have you learned that, you know, what they're doing over there? They were very, um, very telling, you know, of what they were doing. Um, George Harrison, for example, says that he, his life there really isn't that different than his life here was, full of music, friends. Uh, John Lennon is still there that he sees from time to time. Now, you know, this gets into the bigger matter of what is time like. And so there are different explanations of this idea of time. There seems to be a, either a different kind of time for some or no time. Uh, Albert Einstein, I believe, talks about different kinds of time there. And he certainly explored time while he was physical. But what they're doing is, they're all, and this gets back to your question about intent, they're all fulfilling their intent. They're all expressing their intent that they had while they're alive on the other side. So they're still continuing their work because they loved it, right? So 
So people like um, Hunter S. Thompson, for example, provides these beautiful passages about the beauty uh, that he's experiencing there. And as a journalist, it really feels like what he did when he was physical. And just these glorious passages of his about um, how it feels, you know, and what it what it looks like to some degree. Uh, so there is a consistency of 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 experience uh, between their lives when they were physical and their lives when they're non-physical. Anthony Bourdain committed suicide due to depression. Did yeah. you get the sense that he wasn't depressed anymore? He said that he went to a kind of um, uh, rehab place uh, after he died. And that's consistent with other authors who talked about their immediate after life experience where there was healing. There's always healing. There's always healing resources to help people work through their issues. But here's the thing, suicide itself isn't an option because they say that we go as us and we take our problems with us. And yes, there are resources to help us to heal from those and to move on. But those problems that we have in the physical world are so important that we have to work through them. You know, there's just no getting around it, apparently. So that's why suicide isn't an answer, because we have to deal with this stuff sooner than later. It's important to our own growth as souls, I would conjecture. That isn't the exact term that they used, but that's my interpretation of it. I would assume the same would be for Robin Williams, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Robin, Robin has a really great um, passage that um, I can read if you'd like. Yeah. So Robin um, talks about how he has been the chairman of the board of the committee who's helping to write this book that I mentioned earlier, that he's sort of been in charge of the book. And this is the second to the last chapter. So it's a bit of a spoiler, but, um, but there's a lot of good stuff to stay tuned about too. So he talks about, um, he didn't become the chairman of the board and these people in the afterlife didn't get here by being wonderful all the time. He says, we got here by being terribly hurt sometimes terribly hurting others sometimes, and grandly effing up our lives sometimes. That's the point. Now, let me tell you more about who I was when I was alive with you. Some of you knew me as the person who was totally in the moment, contacting unseen elements of imagination and his ability to profoundly address the scene at the time. The actor who was able to conjure the deepest sympathies from others and the most lamentable druggie in the veil of tears known as Hollywood. I was all that, yes. I was able to do more with my body, mind, and spirit than most people. When I got down, I was able to take something. I was able to take more of something than I needed. Then I was able to douse myself with alcohol and other libations to end the suffering I had in my heart, the kind of suffering that only sensitive people know. When I was able, I enjoyed myself immensely, but the pain remained. I was truly another kind of person, a sensitive melancholic who was never ever really able to transcend the suffering of the world. Now, you know people like this. They tend to be up a lot, tend to be nervous at times and fidgety. Maybe they're sympathetic listeners. They are also the kind of people who take things in deeply, effortlessly creating the kinds of worries about everything that occlude their own safety at times. This was me. Then you have very many people like this who trouble themselves with troubles and don't know what to do to end the suffering. This was me then, and it's me now too. Why is it both now? Do you think that I would have abandoned this person because I've grown up to be the chairman of the board? No, that's the point here. I'm that way now too, only in another kind of realm where I have collected these wonderful attributes of selfhood with a capital S. 
I can't be the chairman of the board without this sad little suicidal maniac who I was. And I love now more than anything, perhaps. I'm more than him, yet I'm still him too. What would your requirements be for a chairman of the board who would guide this kind of thing? Would you want them to be mean, cruel, or dishonest? No, you would want him to be like Robin was, kind, generous, suffering his own woes with dignity. He is and was somebody who you want in your corner. Therefore, he's also the chairman of the board. So he's talking about how no one's ever abandoned. No one's ever abandoned. And we continue on as souls in process, this greater selfhood he describes as being the chairman of the board. But the chairman of the board wouldn't be that. God, if you want to call another few steps up the ladder, whatever, God would not abandon this self who he was. So he's saying that we can't go forward without compassion for who we are. And I think that's just such a beautiful, beautiful thing to keep in mind that there's purpose to our suffering and we can heal from it. And we also move beyond it. Did any of the people that you spoke to reveal to you anything that was shocking? There were a couple of things that I did not put in the book. Why is I that? I wanted to protect their privacy. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but I will, I'll try to think of the shocking things. I mean, I don't know if it was shocking, but it was a huge surprise because I, um, I assumed going into this that all of these evolved people, you know, you would assume would stick to what I had in mind for a certain amount of pages for a chapter. And Ayn Rand, when she came through, right? She's the one who wrote the 800 page books. And I think she was a, a speed addict actually when she, and she might still be actually on the other side. She hasn't decided to heal that maybe. Um, said that um, she didn't want to stop. She wanted me to drop everything and write a book with her. And then, you know, I, I said, no, I can't do that. You know, right now I've got this other cool book, you know, I have in mind if I can pull it off. And she said, uh, uh, well, you know, she, she didn't want to stop her chapter. She, she went on for 14 single spaced pages. <laughs> this was before the book, you know, it happened in pages and she just didn't want to end it. And at the end of the chapter, I said, wow, this is really surprising. Like you were kind of pushy about this. And she said, yeah, that's who I was when I was living. And that's who I am now living still in the afterlife. She said, you have to assert your will too over the situation. And, and so it became sort of like a, um, an unspoken thing that I thought existed, but really didn't because that's how similar she is now in the afterlife than she was when she was physical. So that was a big surprise. Have any of the friends or relatives of these people that you spoke with ever contacted you? They haven't. No, I haven't reached out to them. I don't know how they're going to respond to it. I'm very careful to not trade on people's names or images. When I, um, when I for example, quote from the book, I use the person's name who I believe wrote it from the afterlife, but I always put attributed next to it because I can't claim, I don't want people claiming to put words in my mouth. And I feel like that's how a, a loved one might feel, um, especially if they're looking after the property rights. So I try to, you know, put the information out there in a way that will be respectful. Did anybody ever mention anything about reincarnation to you? Yes. Yeah. Was that? It was oh, it was after um I had channeled Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and Harriet Tubman. There was a lot of stuff happening, you know, during COVID lockdown and a lot of Black Lives Matter presence on the airwaves. 
And so naturally they were in my mind and I wanted them to weigh in on what they thought about this whole thing. And right after that, I had the impulse uh, to say, look, I've already channeled, it was about a half a dozen people by then. How do I know that I'm asking the right people? Maybe there's somebody who has the right thing to say for this next chapter that I don't even know about. And this, this gentleman came through named John Barron, who I've never heard of, 15th century Scotsman who worked on slave ships and was a horrible person when he was alive. And uh, I would like to read, I could, I would like to read his chapter uh, or just a little bit of his chapter. Sure. Because the way he talks about it is so beautiful. So, so John Barron talks about this terrible life that he lived as a slaver and how when he went into the afterlife, he went as himself, as seems is consistent with all the accounts that we go as we are. And when he got there, he was bragging about what a great man he had been, right? And he um and then his words just sort of started echoing back to him. And he realized how he began to realize how terrible he was. And then this is what he has to say, has to say. Um, he said, in questing towards an answer that I could hold in my mind as the purpose of my life, I had none. I had no reason to believe that my life as John Barron had any purpose. This was something that was terrible to realize. I had no purpose. Then it dawned on me like day broke through night that the experiences I had had would be forever beneficial if I could repent to do good, to learn from what I had done, to speak out, to share that I had not done well, that others might benefit. I hold this to my heart whenever I feel badly, because I do feel badly when I have the focus of looking only at John Barron. However, I now hold a place of selfhood with a capital S beyond John, and this is what I want to share with you now. I hated the physical world. I hated my place in it. I caused suffering and death as a result. I hadn't any love for myself either. So I took it out on everybody else, including the poor slaves that I was an accomplice to berating and subjecting to torture. I was not the person I wanted to be. So after my death and the terrible realization of who I had, who I had been, I became somebody else. I took on the healing that was required. The punishment was not needed. I was punishing enough to myself. My inner life was sparked by something divine that told me that even the worst sinner can repent, and I did. I repented forever, it seemed, until one day I was able to not have to. I learned that doing goodness was my reward. I became a minister in another lifetime. I helped with the cause of the emancipation of slaves, too. I had a deep and abiding love for Africans that I caused so much harm to. I let go of my feelings of superiority. I had not any reason to do this except for the sheer necessity of saving my own soul from the fires of hell, the hell of my own sin, the hell of my own conscience. And in this, I found true grace. I couldn't have said that any better because this is someone's firsthand experience. And he's talking about how hell does exist. And it doesn't exist as perhaps we've been taught it is, but it's our own conscience that holds us accountable. And I would go on to say that that conscience is divine. It's godlike. Earlier, you mentioned that you wrote this book to help people. In what way do you want to help people? I want people to not be so fearful about death. Um, either our own death or the death of our loved ones, because it is a natural part of life. And there are things to look forward to beyond this physical reality. I also um, want people to realize that these loving energies are around us all the time. Most of the authors of this book say that. 
They say, we're here for you. We want to help you. We love you. In fact, even reading the book brings us, and I can say this because I've read the book many times and I keep rereading it and people do keep rereading it because it brings us into this state of feeling that they are with us. Every single person in the book, when you read their chapter, you feel like you're with them. And I have every reason to believe that we are with them, that we are with them then. I've had um, an expert in literary stylistics, um, Professor Lance Butler, formerly of University of Edinburgh, uh, say that these people all sound like they're supposed to sound, that I'm either a great fake, you know, for writing in the styles of people, or this is coming from somewhere else. And I can tell you that I am not even interested in doing some kind of fraudulent work that this came from from them. It certainly did not come from me. Are there any other common patterns or themes that you recognize between the different people you spoke with? Yes, they all went as themselves. They're all themselves. So we go as we are. And that's something I mentioned earlier. So they're all who they are, but they're also sort of speaking from their evolved sense self perspective. So we go as we are. Um, there is healing. Um, even uh, even the idea of sin uh, is, is talked about as a way of healing. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. says, Every sinner comes to us out of their own volition to 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 be a better person, right? To to heal themselves. Uh, there are references to divine presence, although it's a little different for everybody. And I think it's because they take their their thoughts and their beliefs with them. Uh, Hunter S. Thompson says the framework is holy. He was not a religious person, uh, so that's the kind of thing he would say. Harriet Tubman talks about God. Uh, she says that she died without sin, and one can really understand that. I mean, I believe that's totally true. I mean, she was an angel on earth. So she didn't have a lot of healing to do, for example. She was one with God throughout her life, and she is now, she says. So that's how she describes this divine presence. Um, and so others, you know, talk about greater selfhood and being the best people that we can be. So it is inspired. Uh, they are inspired now by these, whatever this divine presence is that they describe in, in different terms. Do you fear death at all? I really don't. I really don't. I'm I'm uh I'd like to know more about it. You know, there are a lot of um scientific studies out, near death experiences, uh that people are learning from how the process happens. So I'd like to know a little bit more uh about it. And uh I know that many of your guests probably are doing a great job of informing people of that. So I need to I need to learn more about that, but no, I'm really not. I feel as though I'm going to be in their company again. Uh, as well as my own relatives and loved ones, and I, I have a firm belief that that um, that's going to happen. I'm also doing the work now to let go of beliefs that don't suit me anymore. You know, um, and so I'm I'm healing myself of my own whatever my hangups are because uh, I'd rather do it now than later. You know, I'd rather do the work now than later. So that continues. And I just trust that I'm going to go when when my time when my time is here. In fact, um, you know, it's said that every death is its own poetry, you know. And uh, uh, one of the um, one of the authors, Douglas uh, Douglas Adams, who wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, talks about achieving his own, beautiful death 
because in his books he talks about um you know clutching a towel in times of of um difficulty and and to not panic and at the end of his life he he died clutching a towel you know he had a he had a heart issue and he died from from this issue and he was clutching a, a towel to his death. so he so i i see death differently now after reading the book even than i did before because we have accounts now of people who um who have survived it do you write about yourself in the book i well i do because but as minimally as possible uh i want i don't want to get in the way what i do what i did was talk about the process in the forward about how all this happened very spontaneously because who's going to I mean, you, you wouldn't believe my story unless you read it. You know, I think I think people need to know how this miracle happened, you know. Uh, and then I provide an introduction to each chapter, as brief as I can make it, uh, talking about, um, you know, who was on my mind at the time, maybe uh, odd things that happened that made me think of these people. And... Uh, also, a little bit about that person. So if you've never heard of the author of a chapter, you can read a little bit about them and get you know get a get a set of of ideas about what they were like, enough to be able to enjoy enjoy the chapter. Uh, so but that's all that's all I did. I really did not want to get in the way of the author and the reader. What do you suggest the readers should do after reading your book? There are a couple of things that come to mind. One is, if you need help, get it. If you need to speak to a therapist, um, if you need to speak to a, a non-physical you know, person, a guide like me, do it. Because now's the time to release our fears, our, whatever grief we've been carrying, maybe the loss of a loved one. Uh, so if you need help, get it. And and especially people who are, who are contemplating suicide. So I actually give the number for the suicide hotline in, in the book in case someone's struggling with that. Um, the other thing is that um, I know I know people who read the book again, again and again, uh, because there's so much in it that you just want to savor every morsel that you might not have found along the way. But the third thing is that it is a wonderful gift for people. Because it really is not, it doesn't use language that's dogmatic in any way. It's not, a, it doesn't use religious language so much. I think maybe someone can make the case that, yeah, you talk about God, that's religious. That's not, it's not that. It's not anyone trying to enforce a certain way of thinking, including New Age language. It's not a New Agey book so much because this information is as old as we are. These are just truths in my view about the nature of reality and life after death. So that that nomenclature that sometimes gets in the way of people's reading experience is gone. Anyone who's religious or from the new age kind of uh, community, even the scientific community, I think, will find value in this in this book. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions about the book. Are you open to that? Absolutely. And they can reach me on my website at thewayofspirit.com. And that's where all of my contact information is. And I'd be happy to help anyone um, with whatever, whatever they need. Are you working on another book? I am working on another book, yeah. And um, it's so exciting. I can't really talk about it right now. <laughs> I have to keep it under wraps for a while. Um, but I'm, I, I am. And it's going to be probably from the perspective of one really wonderful author who is no longer physical. I'll leave it at that. Before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yes, yeah, so I'd like to read this passage from Jane Roberts, who provides the introduction and the last chapter of the book. 
And so this, these are the very last words of the book that she provides us. She says, you're here now too with me. You're in the bigger space with your friends here too. You're with your very best friends now. With the writing of this book, we've been able to share with you the glorious afterlife that awaits you without your needing to feel afraid at all. What better gift to allow yourselves to understand what really is true? If not, we will make sure you do when you see us here in the beautiful afterlife. We want to express our deepest gratitude for hearing us. We want to assure you that we will be with you in your dreams as much as you'd like us to. Dream on, dear humans, dream on. With loving thoughts, Jane Roberts. Joanne, thank you for that message, and thank you again for being my guest. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Take care. You too. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.